Welcome to the Hazel Rockets podcast, the number one golf podcast for new product launches, interviews with industry experts, golf trends, and more. Here are your hosts, Jen, Ken, and Bill. Hey everyone, I'm Jen. I'm Ken. And I'm Bill. And welcome to our very first episode of Hazel Rockets. We are so excited that you're joining us today and would be remiss of me not to remind everyone to please subscribe to us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, and if you're so bold, you can even catch us on YouTube where for a limited time, we're even giving away uh, some free stuff if you uh, subscribe to us. So I think since it's our very first podcast, maybe we should introduce ourselves, tell everyone a little bit about who we are. Um, You want to start us off? Okay, so I'm Jennifer Morton. I work for Morton Golf. Um, I've been in the golf industry now for, gosh, I hate to admit this, but a little over 30 years. I guess that makes me kind of old. Um, I'm a former buyer. Uh, I currently work in marketing for Morton Golf. Um, outside of marketing, well, okay, for marketing, let's see. I manage over a dozen websites, probably twice that many social sites. It's a lot. Um, I do a marketing calendar for the Association of Golf Merchandisers, and uh, I do a little bit of speaking engagements every now and then. Outside of golf, I, uh, I'm a soccer mom, I have four kids, and I run a paranormal group, so I totally am into ghosts, and so October is a pretty fun month for me, and I'm a massive Disney fan. So. That's a little bit about me all over the map. Uh, Bill, why don't we go with you next? Yeah, sure thing. So I, too, have been in the golf industry for over 30 years um, as a teaching professional and a certified club fitter in my past, uh, currently working as the retail operations manager for Morton Golf. Um, Like Jennifer, I'm a huge Disney fan outside of golf. Uh, Probably one reason why we're doing a little hosting together here. Um, We have been to Disneyland together and Disney World, I would say, at least a dozen times. Yeah, yeah. super fun. Um, I love uh, classic television, Star Wars, Star Trek, some of those fun things. Which you might be able to tell by a few of our little gadgets we that yeah. Bill brought Robot to Robot B9 us. from yeah. Lost in Space, one of the most classic uh, sci-fi uh, TV series from back in the 1960s. Does he talk? Oh, he does. What does he should say? We, should we let him say a little uh, something? I think What's so. his iconic uh, thing that he says here? Let's see. Danger! Danger, Will Robinson! Oh, yeah. You guys might remember that. So. Okay, Bill's our biggest kid that we're going to have on set. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll we, just say we, that. We don't remember it because we were out playing when we were yeah, kids. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, I was nicknamed Latchkey when I was young. Right? Yeah. Every, every TV show. Yeah. But uh, aside from that, these days in my spare time, do a lot of community theater and uh, musical theater. So, um, are you gonna sing us a few songs as the as the series progresses? Oh, well, good. As the series progresses, not on the first podcast. <laughs> okay, okay. Good, but yes, yes. <laughs> come see good. the show. Yeah. So, Kenny, uh, I'm Ken Morton Jr. I uh, am in my uh, next year will actually be my 40th year here at Hagen Oaks, and um, and you're 42, right? <laughs> yeah, practically. <laughs> I uh, started giving change out here on the driving range when I was uh, eight years old. And Where's here? Because uh, we should say, even though we have this marvelous set, yeah. we are really scrunched into a very small space. Yeah, the Hagen Oaks Golf Super Shop is where our uh, filming is. Um, it's a lar- very large retail store, and, and lots of Sacramento who buys retail stuff likes to come here. Um, and But we also uh, kind of go worldwide with our online storefront, mortongolfsales.com as well. So. Which is our first sponsor. Yay, thanks, Morton Golf Sales. Yep, yep. Uh, personally, I do all of the purchasing um, and head up uh, all of the marketing for Morton Golf uh, and its four golf properties. Um, I uh, love country music. We put on a big uh, music festival called Golf and Guitars every May uh, that raises, uh, we've raised about a million two for children's charities since we started. Um, and I write for a handful of country music publications, um, including that NashvilleSound.com and SavingCountryMusic.com. Um, I coach kids soccer and baseball. I've probably coached a couple dozen teams over the uh, the course of our history as well. And uh, I'm an author. I've written a handful of books on golf retail uh, called The Little Books of Big Golf Promotions as well. So, you also the former president of the Association of Golf Merchandisers. You're on the what NGBA 
board yet. That'll yeah. happen next week. We'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit as well. All so, right. All, all right. very active in golf. I think that's the bottom line. So. All right. Well, that's a little bit about us, just so you can kind of get to know us. As, as the episodes progress, I'm sure you're going to know more about us than, you know, you care to. Um, well, I think we should just kind of dive in, just talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of golf, and uh, then we'll introduce our special guest as, as we move on. What do you guys think? Sounds, Sounds good. good. Yeah. All right, why don't we talk about the new Titleist golf ball that's coming out. I know we have Titleist coming on the show in a couple weeks, but Titleist is introducing a brand new ball, the EXP01, which we don't really have a lot of information about. Uh, Ken, what do you know about it? Yeah, so it's kind of secretive. It's um, they uh, typically when they do product launches, it's you know a big PR push. It's being used out on tour. Um, and uh, this particular time, they have gone about this at a completely different angle. Um, it is a, what we know is that it is a white box that simply says Titleist on it and then EXP01. It's going to be delivered in the month of October. We were hoping that we would have ours to show you guys today, but yeah. maybe next week we'll yeah. have it. They haven't even given us a formal launch date yet. Um, now, I should say, for those of you watching, a white box always signifies what when a new ball's coming out. It's a it's a test. It's ball. a test exactly. Yeah. So a lot of times in the industry we'll get a test golf ball two three four months out and ahead of time. Yep. Yeah, with this totally. completely white. There's no writing. There's no logos. There's nothing on there. And it's always kind of exciting for us because it's like we're the first to see and here yeah. Titleist is going to do this as their. So marketing. the question yeah. I have is why why is Titleist even doing this? They're no, the number one ball on tour. They're number one in sales. You know, when you're number one, why do you even need to keep going? So what I know is, like, out on tour, they have about 12 different variations of Pro V1 and Pro V1X golf balls. and At any one time? At any one time. Uh, and, and the tour pros get to choose from any of those. If you ever go to the USGA, um, the ball conforming list, there's, like, like 25 different variations of Pro V1 golf balls that have been approved for use. The public only sees two of them, though. Mm -hmm. And um, I think as kind of golf progresses, we're going to see more personalization in terms of flight characteristics of golf balls. We've, you know, Bill and I, I mean, it used to be how many, there was four different kinds of Titleist golf balls, yeah, and now there's it. eight or nine. I think there'll be 14 or 15 come, you know, in another five to 10 years. Just, just because, from Titleist? Just from Titleist, because people are kind of getting it more narrowed in terms of focus of ball flight and playing characteristics and cover hardnesses and softnesses and in this particular case I think what they're doing um, is just trying to float some balls create some excitement create some conversation just like we're having here um, and then based on the recommendation or lack thereof of the customers trying this golf ball every ball uh, it, or every dozen is going to have a form for customers actually to uh, log in and actually tell uh, Titleist what their uh, experience was with the golf ball. Kind of like a review, basically. Yeah, exactly. Ball, At that point in time, they're going to determine whether or not it actually sees the light of day in 2020. Is this a new uh, Pro V1 or is this a completely different ball? Completely different ball. Um, what I know is that is a urethane covered golf ball, uh, which is the same type of material used in Pro V1s and Pro V1Xs. It's only three pieces, though. The, the Pro V1 is a three piece golf ball. Um, but a Pro V1X is a, a fork-piece golf ball, so it's a little bit different from the X. Um, I am guessing, from the little bit that we found out a little bit, is that it's a new compound in the urethane. Um, I, I, we've heard rumors that in 2020, Bridgestone is going to be coming out with a golf ball that, for lack of a better term, is stickier on the cover than a normal golf ball, with the idea that... Um, it's not going to create more spin off the driver, but will hopefully grip better off of the putter and the uh, your wedges and in and around the green to give you a better feel and put in part different spin on it. I'm guessing it's a little bit of that. You know, it's called an MTR developmental cover system, and there. That's a lot of words, but what does that mean? So again, on the box itself, it says a short game spin enhancing urethane prototype cover. Okay, now that I think is an important thing, especially coming from Titleist, because Titleist has always believed. I don't know if any of you guys have gone through their um, Titleist fitting, but they're very much. Um, want to fit their customers not from the T but from the green and working their way back um, which has always been Titleist's philosophy and this seems I mean just that one little statement very much seems to um, dive into Titleist's uh, beliefs on that 
Um, what else does it say? Uh, or what else can you tell us? So it has an innovative core technology. They say a high speed core construction. Again, they all are. This is a lot that. of a lot of buzzwords. Yeah. Uh, low spin on long game shots, and I think that's a, that's a, a point of differentiation. The Pro V1 is a low trajectory. Pro V1X is high. This is going to have a more of a low trajectory shot uh, off the tee. But again, if they're able to deliver high spin and around the green, that could be a um, good variation. I know you're a Callaway staffer. The ERC ball has been kind of that same in betweener. Yeah. yeah. And I have right. a feeling this is kind of, and that's been a good seller. It's been really good this yeah. year. Yeah. Um, and I have a feeling this is to kind of to go up against that ball in there. And then last but not least, they have a new dimple design. It's a 346 dimple design, which is, I think, 10 to 12 fewer dimples than what's on the Pro V1. Okay. So that's interesting. Uh, I think that's going to be a difficult ball to for most people to get their hands on. Um, I know it's very it's going to be very limited on quantities that most uh, places are going to be able to have. Yeah. So um, as you know, our listeners have a chance to to see it and try it. We'd be interested in hearing your feedback as well. So drop us a line. Um, you can either leave a message um, on our YouTube channel on the show, or you can even email me, jmorton at hagenoaks.com. Uh, yeah, there's one other feature that's kind of unique, too, and I, we're going to see it on Pro V1. Yeah, but what's that? On the side stamp of the ball, there's actually an arrow that goes up underneath the EXP01 on the side stamp on the ball. Um, and from an alignment aid, or, you know, same thing with Callaway. Same, yeah, triple track. Uh, the triple track. It's been huge uh, selling. They've now added it onto the Chrome Softs, and... I think on all of the golf balls coming out, we're going to see alignment aids so that when you're when you're standing over that putter um, and aim towards your target, you can actually aim the line towards the target you're putting at. And um, if you've got a dot or a line on top of your putter, you can create a consistent parallel line. Takes there. one variable out of knowing what what you're going to do before you hit that. Putter. So exactly. alignment aids, even on your uh, golf balls these days, I yeah. think that's, yeah. that's built definitely, in. This, yeah. this particular ball has that, whereas the current Pro V1 doesn't. Again, there's rumors that it's going to get added close to Christmas time. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Um, Ken, I know you're traveling next week. Are you going to be here for our next show? Uh, I will be back, yes. Uh, Where but, are you going? Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm headed to uh, Dallas, Texas. And uh, we are a member of a group called the National Golf Buyers Association, uh, Golf Headquarters Group. Um, it's about 70 independent retailers across the United States. We're a dying um, breed. Yeah. Uh, that have all kind of gotten together uh, and collectively put their um, buying power together so that we can um, hopefully buy uh, special buys and do special makeup products and uh, negotiate with our vendors so that we can bring the best pricing and the best uh, values back to our respective customers in and around the United States. And so every year we have an annual meeting and uh, uh, this particular year, we're, we're headed down to, to uh, the Lone Star State, and we'll be uh, spending uh, one day doing some education work, and then uh, two days meeting with about, uh, I think we've got about 30, 32 vendors that we're, we're meeting with down there. That'll be fun. So, yeah, um, uh, it's pretty fun. We um, Actually, for the uh, first time, we're, we're going to take a leadership role. Um, we've, we've throw, I've thrown Here's my me. hat in there uh, to become on their board of directors. Um, which I'm excited about. There's, uh, again, as we talked about, like personalization with, with products. Um, when you're saying personalization, I mean, I think we're, most of us are thinking like name imprinting. Is that what you're talking about? It, that's part of it. But, you know, as we're seeing with, you know, drivers, you can, you know, with Callaway, you can do all kinds of different colors on your wood now uh, through Pingworks. I mean, there's literally nothing you What's can't. What's Pingworks? So Pingworks is a division within Ping. It's kind of a tour department that's available for the public. And you can do paint fill on putters. You can add tungsten to make the putter any weight Heavier. that you want. Uh, you can create lines where there weren't lines, take off lines where there were lines. Um, heck, we you know, a couple years ago, we had a customer who uh, wanted to make a left-handed um, stainless steel Scottsdale answer putter and those were only available in manganese bronze and uh, this particular customer we we made the request down there and um, Ping's unique that they have their own casting house that's uh, still available that's called Dolphin 
um, and they actually sent the request over to Dolphin, and they literally cast him one off putter. I mean, he has the only one in existence, and it was very, very expensive. But uh, through Pingworks, there's you know there's har- literally nothing they can do when it comes to designing. And a, you see more companies going this route. Totally. Or? Again, it, it, everything's unique. Uh, you know, with Cameron has their studio store that they you know that you people are sending their putters to have work done. Um, and we actually do quite a few of those just in house as well. We Maybe do. Vokey we'll has their those. studio. Um, you know, Toulon has their 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 putter studio down at Callaway. It's an incredible stamping on the Vokeys. Um, yeah. for personalization. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, actually, there's some secondary stores like uh, SixSticks.com, and we've got one here in Northern California called NorCal Putters that you can send your golf clubs to, and they'll refinish with. Like we we did two of them in house with some old Camerons. It's beautiful gold iridium finish on one and then this other uh, finish that they treat with uh, heat and it it was like this black purple thing that changed colors at the way you turned around the putter and so anyways with being in this kind of uh, hopefully um, more executive position with with the the NGBA we can be talking to the manufacturers to be delivering some uh, unique products that will be exclusives to our stores and, and things that customers can't find anywhere else. Maybe golf ball collars that weren't available that now are available and some special edition golf bags and unique putter designs. And um, I'm real excited. I think, you know, for me, that kind of tabs the creative part in my brain that I, I'm excited to, to work with the manufacturers. And customers always like stuff that they're, uh, they're, their buddies can't get or you know that are limited yeah and Um, actually kenny if you're gonna do this i mean you will probably take this to a new level but for all of our customers who've shopped at our golf expo at at hagen oaks you've already been the beneficiary of of ken's creativity and our special buys and things that you can only get here and a lot of you know that every every spring you see that so yeah this is going to be fun it'll be fun i think i'm excited to over the course of meetings and, and in future um uh, podcasts we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what came out of those and, and some of the designs that are coming from there yeah that sounds great all right um moving on okay uh cameron champ recently had a big win um safe safeway way, open safeway Napa. open um incredible yeah story. uh want to mention him because we're out of sacramento cameron's out of sacramento there was a lot of talk about his grandpa uh who actually used to work here um what do you guys think just again, uh, is, he, is he a name that's here to stay? Oh, Cameron's amazing. His talent level is off the charts, and to have that, you know, come at a time when his grandfather's ill just uh, couldn't have been uh, scripted any better. And we're just so happy and proud of him. Uh, you know, being his hometown, uh, just pretty amazing. Pretty amazing win. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his grandpa Mac was a first tee greeter for us over on the Arc- Arcade Creek Golf Course, and at Hagen Oaks. Well, yeah, at Hagen, and was a was a fixture out here, and the nicest guy you've ever met. Yeah. I mean, we we love Mac, and and wish him the best of luck. He's he's in a tough spot, um, has been well documented, and and uh, we we send our best to the the whole Champ family there. But um, Cam, you know, was in our Little Inker program, and and you know we've had him out here since he was five or six years old and he's been hitting it by bill and i since he was probably oh, 10 yeah. um it's the longest farthest drives i've ever seen in my whole no, life and had since he was 12 or 13 years old it's head and shoulders above most of the tour players now too getting yeah. it that much further which is just a huge advantage it's almost like when tiger first came on the tour in the late 90s and how far he was hitting it past the tour players back then Cameron's in that same situation now, so yeah. it's just a yeah. He, 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 at the Safeway Open, I was reading this morning. He actually had the longest driving distance. But again, most you know, if you think about the long drive guys, they can hit it a country mile, but can't putt or chip. Correct. He actually had the highest scrambling percentage of any of the players. Also, yeah. So um, for having it, having that skill level at both levels is is truly amazing. So yeah, he's you know, he's number two in the FedEx Cup points now already. Fantastic. And qualified for the Masters, so we'll get to watch him next April as well. Awesome. So, uh, Cam is he is a wonderful young man. I mean, he, we forget he's 22, yeah. 23 now. Um, you know, in all of those interviews they were having with him afterwards, it, you know his his maturity, um, you know, transcends his age yeah, beyond his years. Yeah, so, that, that, sure. there's no doubt about that. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so at this point, I think it's time for us to bring on our very first guest, um, who uh, we didn't have to go far to uh, find our first guest. 
It's um, your dad, my father-in-law, Ken Morton Sr., who is, uh, uh, happens to be the most awarded golf professional in PGA history. Um, I'm going to read through some of these accolades because I don't want to miss some of them. He was inducted into the National PGA Hall of Fame in 2005. He won the National PGA Professional of the Year Award in 1998. He's a two-time National PGA Merchandiser of the Year winner. He's the National PGA Junior Golf Leader Award winner. He won the National PGA Horton Smith Award for PGA Education. Uh, California Golf Writers, Golf Person of the Year Award, Golf Digest Magazine's Top 72 Most Important People in the Golf Industry Honor Award. He's an honorary chairman of the PGA Senior Tour Gold Rush Classic, National Advisor, excuse me, National Advisory Council member for Titleist Accushionant Company. And just earlier this year, he was inducted into the NC PGA Hall of Fame. Ken? And we welcome you on to our show. Well, thanks for including me. I'm really excited to be here to hear what this is all about. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. Thanks Thank for much. Your longevity in the world of golf is something I think that's really, truly amazing and remarkable, and especially in this day and age when um, the golf business really has um, changed a lot. Um, do you guys have some questions we want to ask? No, I just uh, maybe we'll kind of maybe start at the beginning and maybe talk a little bit about... Um, kind of what brought you into golf and it kind of, you know, I get uh, an insight just because I've lived it, but kind of how caddying kind of brought you into the game. Well, um, I was born in 1940 and I grew up on my grandpa's branch because uh, my dad early in his uh, life was, was blind and uh, we really uh, were very poor. And uh, I ran into this guy uh, around the corner that was caddying at the Del Paso Country Club, was a year or two older than me. And uh, he seemed to have money in his pocket every day, and I didn't have any. So I thought, well, I need to get involved. So I went out to the Del Paso Country Club at age 11 uh, when they would only accept kids 12 and above, but I lied about my age. And I started caddying. And by golly, I began to put a few uh, bucks in my pocket and I began to be able to buy some new clothes that I'd never had before. And I thought, man, this is really fantastic. So as, as uh, time went on, uh, I got to know the members really well and uh, many of the uh, uh, female members uh, kind of adopted me as, as, uh, as their favorite caddy. And uh, they even bought me stuff at my birthdays and, and Christmas and other times of the year. And I really connected with the members over there. And uh, really over time, uh, Mr. Minch, the, uh, the head professional at uh, Del Paso Country Club, began giving, giving me lessons every Saturday morning and developing me uh, not only as a caddy but as a player. I began uh, playing really uh, good golf, got to be able to win a few junior tournaments, and it just kind of evolved over time uh, into me not wanting to do anything but be around a golf course. So here I am now, 79 years old, and so that means I've been in this golf thing since 1968. Um, and a, a real interesting thing happened uh, when I was about 18 years old. Uh, Tom Lapresti at the Hagen Oaks Golf Complex uh, needed a person that could repair clubs. Tom was the original head golf pro here at Hagen Oaks. He started back when the course started in 1932. That's so, correct. Yeah, and was a legend in his own right. He was a yeah. former PGA professional of the year. And uh, before uh, he was uh, at Hagen Oaks, he happened to be the caddy master at the Del Paso Country Club. So the connection between Tom Lapresti and Frank Minch Sr. was very, very close. And Frank Minch Sr. was talking to him one day about uh, that uh, about me and uh, my club repair skills. And then Tom says, man, I have to have a guy with club repair skills. And so in 1958, he hired me to come here at Del Paso, at the Hagen Oaks Golf Complex. And, uh, and then, you know, I've just I've been here ever since and uh, really just trying to do the best I can to, to serve the people. Uh, I, I don't know anything else but golf. 
<laughs> so, Ken, I know there was a time when, I mean, you were, you were a real player. You had to make a choice between going on tour or staying in the business side of it. Uh, what kind of led you one way or the other? Well, you know, in, um, back in the early 60s, um, the, the top 25 players barely made a living on the tour. And uh, and uh, I, I was a very competitive player, played really well. I had a group of people who came to me and wanted to sponsor me on the tour. Uh, but then I began to look at, well, what were they making on the tour? And, and I really decided, you know, that my love for the game was really serving people. Uh, it really wasn't uh, playing golf uh, and, and uh, getting all the satisfaction from that. So I decided to stay as a club professional. Uh, rather than go out and being a playing professional. Uh, however, about two or three years later, Arnold Palmer came on the scene, and the numbers dramatically changed on the tour. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I've never um, not felt good about the decision I made. Uh, this is where I want to be. I love the people in Sacramento, and I love the golfing public in Sacramento. I wouldn't want to be any place else. If I look back at my life and career, I wouldn't change a day of it. Yeah, you, you talked about money. Our the very first professional check Ben Hogan won uh, was here at Hagen Oaks in 1942. He finished third in the Sacramento Open, which was a PGA Tour event back in the day, and took home a whopping three hundred and fifty dollars. What is that in today's money, though? <laughs> yeah, about you know a few thousand, but it, but you know Not nowadays. But now third place is probably oh, yeah. six, seven hundred thousand yeah. dollars. I mean, I mean, what and what did Cameron I had champ win last week? Wasn't it like one, yeah. one point two million? million. One point two million yeah. dollars. Yeah. So a slight difference there, I think. In in well, you know, what's interesting that I don't think the modern golfer or maybe a customer or golfer understands that uh, in the late nineteen fifties and the early sixties. The tour was made up mostly of club pros, and then uh, they would drive from tournament to tournament uh, in the off seasons. Uh, some of them would even um, get on a in a in a car of a train where they could sneak on the train and get from one city to the nether. I mean, it was a completely different uh, era than today, uh, and uh, you know the club pro could could. Uh, just go right into a tournament. Later on, the club pro had to qualify on Mondays for the tournament. Now the club pro really has no way to get into the the tour other than going through the, the uh, minor tours. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple events throughout the year, like the PGA Championship, where there's a few, but yeah, it's it's kind of few and far between. Well, and, and frankly, the club pro uh, would really can't compete with, with the skill sets and uh, the uh, the abilities of the people on the tour today. Yeah. Um, if you're doing your job, uh, you just don't have the playing time. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Before we kind of jump into kind of later career stuff, I, there's a story uh, that one of the fellow inductees into the NCPGA Hall of Fame is a, a dear friend of yours, Steve Mencinella. He's the uh, longtime head pro director of golf down at Sunnyside Country Club down at in, down in Fresno. Um, you at the induction ceremony told a great story when it came to junior golf that I think is worth recounting here. So um, Steve was from Rockland. His dad was a banker and uh, he was a good junior golf player. Uh, I was caddying at the country club and uh, the, the head pro there, Frank Minch Sr. said, you know, Ken, you need to go play in this tournament uh, and let's see how well you're competing. So I didn't know Steve at all. And so uh, we went to uh, this tournament and uh, played. And, and so at the end of the tournament, I'm looking up on the board, and uh, uh, he and I and another uh, 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 person by the name of David Finner qualified to go to San Francisco to play in a major junior event down there, which I didn't even know was part of the tournament. And so, um, I, I, frankly, I had really never been out of town uh, I mean, I'd never been to San Francisco. Yeah, and uh, while in, you know, and your in my grandparents, your parents, you know, uh, you know, grandpa's blind at this point in time, and Nana's caring for the family. You, you probably don't even have a way to get there, let alone. I, I don't have a way to get yeah. there. So I was telling uh, Steve, uh, who I just met, 
you know, this is amazing, uh, but I don't know how to how I could get there, or I don't know where I don't even know where the golf course is." And uh, he says, "Well, he says I'll tell you what, I'll talk to my dad, and uh, well, the, my dad will take the three of us down there." And I said, "Wow!" I said, "What a what a great um, idea!" So. Sure as heck, um, I'm at the front of the Del Paso Country Club with my clubs on one shoulder and I've got another handbag on my left hand and they drive up and I get in the car and we go to San Francisco and the next thing I know, I mean we're 15, 16 years old and uh, his dad drops us off downtown San Francisco to this little hotel. Um, and then the three of us are down there all by ourselves. So we stay overnight at this hotel and then the next morning we get up and I think we found a donut shop nearby, had a couple of donuts, and then here comes this car and drives up. It's a big, beautiful white Lincoln, and uh, this this guy gets out and puts the clubs in the trunk, and we all get in there, and I'm in the back seat with Steve, and I said, you know, Steve, this guy looks familiar, and uh, he says, well, he should. That's Ken Venturi, and I said. Ken Venturi, he oh, says, goodness. yeah. So then the next thing I know, we're getting to the Olympic Club where this tournament's at, where I've never been to in my entire life. He drives right up at the first tee. There's 150 kids from all over the West Coast who have qualified to be in this tournament, seeing Ken Venturi get out of the car, open the trunk and hand us our clubs and <laughs> smile at everybody and wave and drives away. <laughs> Yeah. And that was my initial relationship with Steve Minchinella. Wow. I mean, it was an unbelievable thing. Well, can you believe now, 50 years later, Ken Venturi, Steve Minchinella, and Ken Morton Sr. are inducted all together in the NCPGA Hall of Fame for completely different reasons. Wow. wow. Yeah. Clearly, Ken Venturi for his driving Uber works, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> the original Uber. Yeah. yeah. Another another kind of thing, uh, Ken Venturi and I, um, uh, later, we, we were both uh, feature speakers for the uh, National PGA uh, Teaching and Coaching Summit in San Francisco. Uh, and then later, uh, Ken Venturi was here in Sacramento, when we said, I forget what we were celebrating. Our, we dedicated the restaurant. Yeah. yeah. And when the redesign mm -hmm. and all of the memorabilia and history on the tables. Yeah, and he there. and uh, George, George Archer, Archer and Dick, Dick Lotz, Lotz and Dan yeah. Sutherland who, all were part of that. Who all, by the way, all four of those won the state fair championship at yeah. one time in their right. life, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's really, uh, really, uh, for me, very satisfying, rewarding experience. That's awesome. That's great. I want to talk time. about Say Golf. Um, the Sacramento area youth golf that you started and how that program eventually led into the First Tee National Program. So in 1983, um, Kenny Jr. and my other son Tom and Bill and Angie Dixon and other people in the area were golfers, but um, uh, they weren't didn't have anything to connect them themselves together with. Uh, and I was noticing with uh, the Little League that my sons were playing in and the other kinds of sports they were playing in, that there was uh, an organized way of bringing all people together from all over Sacramento to play in sports and compete against each other. We didn't have that in golf at that time. In fact, uh, at that time, we only had uh, two girls, which was uh, Bill's wife, Angie Dixon, and Jamil Jose, who had, uh, who were playing golf at high school, and they were playing on boys' teams. So today we have over 40 high schools with full girls' teams playing in Sacramento, to give you an idea of what's evolved over that particular time. So anyway, that... And, and we're old, but we're not that old. It hasn't been that many years. Yeah. yeah. So then we, uh, I decided... Uh, well, we needed a competing thing to do, and we need to started, start before high school to start preparing kids for high school. That's what created the Little Linker uh, program. Uh, and then uh, it was so well received that... So what is the Little Linker program? The Little Linker program uh, is a, a weekly program through the summer where kids come together that were ages 7 to 12, 
and they played competitively week after week with different events to expose them to competition in golf. Uh, and it, it, it was extremely uh, po popular uh, right out of the gate. Uh, then from there, uh, one of the ladies uh, who had a son playing in the Little Inca program had a Down syndrome uh, 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 child and r recommended that maybe we do something similar for Down syndrome. And so that created what we call the California Eagle program, which today is on two courses. We have over 100 Down syndrome, Down syndrome and cerebral palsy uh, kids, which we started out to be kids playing in the program. In fact, since 1983, we still have two or three of the originals who played there who are now in their 50s. Uh, we also have had a, a, a world uh, games winner, uh, a gold medal winner, and a silver medal winner from that. In from the National the, Special Olympic Games. In the National Special Olympic. Actually, yeah. it was the International Special yeah. Olympic Games. So that's been really good. So we continued to evolve. We began to do junior camps. So we began to do a variety of programs, uh, creating what we thought was a step-by-step -step approach for kids to evolve. And uh, right about this time, Sacramento Unified School District and San Juan Unified School District both ended their funding for golf programs as well, right? Correct. That was the Prop 13 era, yeah. which really helped create the whole Say Golf thing. Uh, I joined with... Uh, the head professional of Del Paso Country Club, Les Streeper, and uh, we uh, went to a um, a, um, a regional uh, high school um, meeting and brought about 400 people with green shirts and uh, actually dropped on the desk of the people a, a newspaper article that was written that morning on Angie Dixon and Jamil Jose to say that this is the outcome of the programs that we have and if we don't have high school golf we can't evolve these kids to get these free scholarships. Angie got a full ride scholarship to the University of Washington and Jamil got a full ride scholarship to Stanford. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, that, and then we decided that then that we would help sponsor the uh, uh, high school programs to keep them uh, in, in evolving and uh, by golly if the uh, school district didn't uh, support us and we didn't lose golf uh, in prop 13 problems that yeah. occurred at that particular I mean, I, time I, I can't imagine i mean golf in high school was such a big part of my experience yeah. in sports for and, sure you know I can't imagine it being without it. I mean, yeah. you're, you're no, on a different. personal note, because I remember when San Juan, in particular, cut the funding. Um, they had you know, there was a parent meeting, and all the parents initially put up money to try to to, to have at least at, at our high school to keep the the season going. But then, with Ken's uh, creation of Sacramento Area Youth Golf, say golf. All the parents were reimbursed, which is just a wow. tremendous thing. Yeah, yeah. I'll never forget I, I that. Know the, at the time, the new the uh, new car dealers association of Sacramento, which was all of the big names in Sacramento, put on this huge fundraiser. I believe yeah. it's Sierra View. Sierra View Country yeah. Club every year, and, and raised tens of thousands of dollars, which they split evenly amongst all the different high schools, yeah. just to keep them going. Correct, uh, because they felt that it was that important. So then, and then the. Um, uh, 1990s, um, late 1990s, uh, I was approached uh, by then Mayor Joe Cerna and the golf division to see if um, uh, uh, Say Golf would be interested in, um, in uh, managing and operating William Lamb Park for the good of children, which, uh, which the board of directors voted to do. And uh, then right after that, uh, I began to see the the first T was coming out with new programs to involve um, different kinds of um, of things that were important for kids to learn about, like core values and uh, and eating habits and life skills and life skills. And uh, so uh, we uh, I began to learn more about them and get involved, and then uh, say, and then say golf became. One of the first three chapters of the first T uh, programs throughout the nation, and, and one uh, of the early leaders of the first T was uh, Joe Louis Barrow, 
Correct. Uh, which is a famous boxer, Joe Lewis's son. Correct. And he came out, and many of the programs that were started here at Hagen Oaks became some models, models some, some right. things that they did naturally, right? Correct. Uh, which uh, was really good because it was a brand new introductory program, and uh, we had been doing it for you know, a couple of decades, and so we had evolved pretty well down the road with many of our programs, and so uh, I actually became part of the advisory council for the first tee, and, and we delivered uh, a lot of the things that we were doing here, along with some other people around the country that were doing some amazing things as well. So, uh, yes, uh, Say Golf was a, a major part of the beginning of the first tee of Greater Sacramento. Uh, over time, Rather than the word say golf, uh, when we also had the first tee, we began to find out that it was difficult to promote two names. Uh, and uh, because uh, the first tee was the bigger name and it was the more important name long term uh, and that we were actually getting some substantial funding from the first tee, we decided then to become the first tee of Greater Sacramento because uh, we felt that it was uh, easier to de raise funds locally with something that was getting so much national attention. I mean, the first tee was actually created by Tim Fincham from the PGA Tour. Uh, it was his baby, and uh, with that kind of background support, we were better off changing our name. Uh, now, the uh, legal name is still Say Golf to this day, but it's Say Golf doing business as the first tee of Greater Sacramento. Hmm. You mentioned a girl named Angie, who she was in the very first uh, Little Inker program with me in that first class in, in 1983. Um, Bill can probably kind of talk firsthand of kind of how this all kind of comes full circle, too. Uh, well, yes. Uh, and again, just like you're talking about, if there's no high school golf, I never meet my future wife. Angie and I have been married for almost 25 years uh, yeah. together for over 32 um, but yeah, so Angie actually is the executive director of the First Tee of Greater Sacramento at this time and having, as Kenny said, come full circle from the first original participant with this guy, uh, growing up through the programs, playing high school golf, getting a scholarship to college, playing four years at the University of Washington, turning professional, playing a little bit uh, on some mini tours, and then to, to now really giving back and, and kind of like Ken, just um, knowing what's important about exposing, uh, I guess it's over 50 plus thousand youths in Sacramento in our area to, to this great game and teaching them what's important, not just golf itself, but using golf as a vehicle to teach them healthy habits and life skills and core values. So it's pretty, pretty it, incredible. It, it's probably worth as a sidetrack, just talking a little bit about the experience this past weekend too. Oh, well, yeah, uh, exactly. You mean with the, you know, Cameron winning, who, yeah. who grew up in the first tee program here in Sacramento, um, and then a young man named uh, Sam Summerhauser, who... Uh, By the time this airs, it's going to be an additional week. Right. Yeah. But, but he won uh, the, the junior pro-am portion at the uh, Pure Insurance Open, which was the, used to be called the first tee open down at Pebble Beach, uh, with Kirk Triplett. And so he's also, he's currently in the first tee program here in Greater in Sacramento. Uh, and then Cameron winning on the same weekend, another PGA Tour event. And then um, uh, all the, the uh, Angie had one of her um, large fundraisers where everyone gets together and helps raise money for the first tee. And Roger Malpe, who was doing the announcing, who's been a longtime PGA Tour player and an announcer, uh, very beloved in, in golf, uh, came out no to, to support um, Angie's fundraiser. Um, as the guest this year and he was fantastic and told some wonderful stories about um, his time on the PGA Tour and actually growing up and how much uh, junior golf means to him and that's why he he couldn't wait to come and, and help uh, the first tee of Greater Sacramento um, finishing in Napa the the night before getting up at 4 30 a.m. and making the drive to Sacramento to be here early on that Monday morning so pretty special uh, timing for uh, for everything to happen, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's been probably hundreds of kids out of that first Little Inker program, you know, it evolving into what it has become that have earned college scholarships all as a result of that simple Little Inker program. It's pretty remarkable legacy if you think about it. Well, the rewarding thing is, is Sacramento now is probably turning out more 
kids receiving college scholarships from Goff and, and their human behaviors that they learned through the first tee and, and Morton Goff than any other city in the, in the nation other than maybe one or two in Texas. So, you know, I think we truly have created this farm system of not only developing kids for golf, but developing good citizens and uh, uh, with good behavioral uh, practices. And I think it's, uh, I think it's unbelievable now kind of what it's uh, turned into and the partnership between uh, Morton Golf and uh, the first tee uh, is is extremely important for us to together uh, be able to do more for kids uh, getting them to the game of golf. The hard thing for me to believe is that I don't think the general public knows uh, the qualities of of changing kids' behavioral habits uh, or bad habits uh, that are gained through the golf programs that are in Sacramento. Uh, it, it is an it is an incredible um, program that, that, that just changes kids and l teaches them the disciplines uh, and core values to be able to get through life. And, uh, and I, I'm surprised that more people don't get into it for that reason. I mean, we're not just, we're not just about golf. That's really probably a third yeah, of what we're right. all about. You're, you're so right. I mean, my own kids, our kids have gone through all of our junior camp programs. And I mean, they're seven and eight years old and they're coming home and bringing home golf balls that have words on them like perseverance and you know, honesty and, and that's integrity. Respect, integrity. integrity. It, those are those are creating dialogue at the dinner table for us of words that, you know, they can't even hardly pronounce but now know the meaning of. And that's you're so right. I mean it's obviously the Cameron Champs are wonderful stories that come out of the first tee. Don't get us wrong. I mean we're he's gonna be a, a wonderful poster child for Sacramento golf and, and youth golf, but but the core values and all of that stuff that come out of the game that go to the kids that aren't going to play any championship level golf they're going to take with them in their workplace and, you know and i need to say something about that i it's the they're not just words to the kids that i think are not taking those um to to play golf moving forward i mean there i know on one level we're talking about the kids that are moving forward and getting the scholarships etc cetera, etc cetera, but there are you know, 10 times more kids that are going through the programs, taking, um, you know, a couple years of golf um, and then moving on to other sports or doing other things like our kids up to now have done. Um, and I'm just going to tell a quick story about my son, Taylor, who, um, um, who got in a pretty severe car accident when... Um, um, when how old was he sophomore year of high school sophomore year of high school and um really changed his direction and his path and that i mean his perseverance and his um use of that word um really i think was something he really held on to for um a long time and i think those values and that value system was something he really truly picked up um, from from golf. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think that really gave him a level of support and a grounding that even though he was not a great golfer, those life lessons I think really helped him um, through through life's challenges that that come to everyone regardless of what direction you end up going well, you know with. in golf there's no referees there's no umpires and honesty is one of the most important things in our sport and uh, just for kids to go through that and learn the importance of counting their scores and putting them down correctly and and that the the problems that happen when they don't do things that are honest I mean that's part of the evolution of the sport it, it, it's an interesting sport because if you cheat or you or you don't do things right, people don't want to play with you. Right. Yeah. And uh, when you learn that at seven or eight or nine or ten years old, that's a pretty important thing going through life. Yeah. Right. Another full circle thing is how you know you go back to the early '80s when they were going to take golf out of the schools. You, you I mean you can speak 
we're actually the, the first year of Greater Sacramento is actually going into the schools now to teach their curriculum. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And even not just high school, but elementary school, middle school. Absolutely. Because the schools find that much value in the sport. I mean, again, that again, it, it all started back in you know '83 in that little Inca program. Correct. None, none of that happens without that beginning. Absolutely, and that's how they touch over fifty thousand now right. in our area. Yeah. Um, I want to move on. Um, Ken, how 60 years in golf is a long time in golf and for you to still be relevant in golf, what do you attribute that to? Well, first of all, um, in some days it seems like just yesterday In some days it seems like a long, long time. Uh, so you kind of go back and forth. Um, but you know, uh, if you love people, and you, and you love being around people, and you love serving people, and trying to make their their lives happier and more meaningful, uh, you just get up every day excited to go to work. So, um, I, I mean, I still have uh, the, the enthusiasm to get up in the morning and do the things that, uh, that, I, that I do. I enjoy being part of our team uh, and uh, being able to contribute in, in some ways. Um, and I enjoy a change. I like to see uh, the evolution of, of, uh, of not only the sport, but of society. And, and so uh, I think it's just about enjoying life, you know. I, I mean, I've been a very, very blessed person through my life. I mean, where I started from to the life I've enjoyed, I am very blessed. And I don't know about you, but I have one more question, and that is, where do you see golf going in the next five to ten years? That is a really good question. Um, golf uh, has uh, takes a lot of time. It's a hard game to learn. Uh, it's, um, uh, but you know, you don't have to be a really good player to be able to enjoy it because really, golf is about relationships with people. It's about being around other people. It's about having fun with other people. It's about being outdoors. I mean. People don't realize it, but golf courses are the largest green belts in our region. I mean, a golf course takes up 160 acres. I mean, that's a big park, right? We have all kinds of wildlife out there. We have, um, you know, you have, you have, you're have you in the trees. You kind of get away from all of the concrete jungle that's downtown. And uh, you can get out in a very peaceful uh, arena. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there's always going to be a place for golf, but I think also um, until we really get the word out to the youth of, of, of America, to let them know what kids get out of playing the game out of golf and uh, what it can mean to them for their whole character throughout their life. They don't have to be good golfers. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about good people. And so... Uh, if, if we can continue to promote that and do the right things, I mean, we're now into um, to learning the athletic development models to prepare kids for the Olympics. I mean, can you imagine such a thing? And, uh, and I think those kinds of things can, can create long-term interest. Um, uh, and, and then the, the game will be healthy down the road. Uh, I don't expect it ever to go away. Uh, but I think now, with the competition of kids growing up in an environment where they can't get outdoors because it's not safe, an environment where they're involved so much in technology to keep them busy when they're in their house, uh, the cell phone thing where it's you're building relationships through texting and other things, I think the changes are dramatic. and. And I think golf is a place where kids can come together and become kids. So um, hopefully uh, it will uh, continue to, uh, to grow um, because it's, uh, it's a beautiful sport. I hate anything to happen to it. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break so we can have a word from our sponsors. And we're going to be right back with our final segment. Hey, Bill here. I wanted to pause real quick to thank our sponsor, MortonGolfSales.com. Morton Golf Sales is the number one online retailer for all your golfing needs. From the newest clubs on the market to the classics that you can't find anywhere else, Morton Golf Sales has the best products and customer service at the lowest possible prices. 
Want to check out their huge online inventory of clubs, clothing, golf balls, accessories, and save 12% on your first order? Just use coupon code ROCKETS at checkout on MortonGolfSales.com. Exclusions apply. See site for details. Now, back to the show. Mom's Beef Hash has a first name. It's from a can we see. But we all have another name. We call it untasty. We hate to eat it every day. And but if you, you ask, ask us why, why we'll say... Cause mama's hash tastes like trash and we should feed it to the dog. Welcome to the Jack Burgeroni Experience. Hi, welcome back. And we're starting our newest segment, the Jack Burgeroni Experience. Yes. And what? I'm not- Wait, 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 what on earth is that? I'm not telling. Okay. Well, so, it sounds appetizing though. I know. Yes, Jack well, Burgeroni. Only okay. cause you know what it is. Uh, maybe someday we'll say what it is, but not today. Um, but it is our, our segment where we're going to talk about something unique, different, interesting, fun, fun, fun. That's the, that's the, that's what we're talking about. Fun. Um, and our first thing we're going to talk about is this. You're like, what is this? The Looks like a putter, Jennifer. Okay. <laughs> it is a putter. This putter, I know. Yeah. <laughs> this putter was actually printed at my house. Not not the shaft and the grip, but the putter itself was the printed head. at my house from my son who printed it on a 3D printer. Wow. Clearly that boy is way smarter than his old man. That's all I can say. Exactly. Yes. So my question to you guys as I ruin our set is, is this where golf is headed? Are we at the point or getting to the point where you are going to be able to print your golf equipment at your house? So... That is my question to you guys, way smart golf peoples. All right, that's the first time she's ever called me smart, by the way. So, um, so I can I got, confirm. Yes, so I can. You know, I got the chance to watch this in motion and um, can give you a little background. There are lots of different putter designs that you can download and print on your three D printer, and those that have the skill set to be able to do so can actually. Uh, redesign and um, knowing a little bit about 3D printers there's a whole bunch of different materials they can be made out of so this particular one is made out of a plastic it's kind of cheap sounding if you, if yeah. you, you know. um, yeah maybe you actually hit that right next to the mic there so you can hear it um, but they there's wood resin you can make it uh, printers out of you can actually print out of copper there's different metals there's you know you name it and you can all materials that real putters are made out of basically yeah yes, and yes. this one was first attempted out of a out of a stronger material than this which is a little but it kept um, the printer we have the 3d printer we have isn't very expensive it's only like uh, you know less than two hundred dollars um, which is less than what a lot of putters cost um, and so when we try to print it with a little bit um, stronger material um, it kept sort of uh, uh, kind of running and uh, uh, clogging up the the nozzle yeah um, and so just so we could get it printed we went with a slightly um, uh, cheaper material which I'm just going to do a quick plug. If you go to our YouTube channel, Morton Golf Sales, we have an entire video where you can see this actually tested. Um, and uh, you can see uh, people that have actually hit this to see how it performed. Um, so quick plug there. Yeah. But um, I, you know, I, what do you think? I sit on an advisory staff for Cleveland and Strixon. And, and, you know, <clears throat> you didn't mention that in your intro. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't count. OK, it doesn't count. Um, but I've had a chance to go back in and spend some time in the R&D with them and a couple of other manufacturers. And as they are uh, building uh, golf clubs on a cam um, and on the computer, um, that's actually how they're printing all of the dummy uh, golf clubs is actually uh, once they design it out, they actually send it to a 3D printer and it actually prints out a three-dimensional image of the golf club so that they can actually look down it, find the shape. If they want to go in and shape the toe or do some fine-tuning on, um, on the look, because not only a, you know, not, you could have an engineered golf club that has tons of really cool benefits and features and a high MOI and all that kind of stuff, but 
you know, we know with square drivers, I mean, there's a lot, been a lot of fads that have kind of come and gone, come and gone that from a look and appeal to, you know, the visual uh, test on a golf club is, you know, would be terrible. Um, but that allows them to I think this looks pretty it. cool. Personally, I mean, for the fact that our 19-year-old son printed this out, I think it looks pretty cool. Now, it sounds, it's kind of lightweight, um, yeah. but... I don't know. Well, I think that's you know, where Kenny's going, though, with the, the R&D uh, that the major manufacturers do. Putting is, especially putting, it's critical. It's the most important part of your golf game. Um, yes, this is awfully neat, and it's cool. It doesn't feel very good from, remember, testing it on a personal level. But, again, with the research and development that is required that goes into creating a putter that's going to perform for people, I don't know if this is necessarily going to be where folks are doing this on their own and getting the results that they're going to want, even if they created the design without the engineering know-how and that kind of a thing. So, so another question I have is what what are your thoughts? I mean, are the golf companies eventually going to get to the point where they're going to design the, the designs? I mean, they're going to spend all the money and all the time creating the designs, and then they're just going to sell those to you and you can print them out at home? I don't is know if that the wave gonna, of the future? I don't see that, but I could see a company. There's like a vendor called Harico, which sells um, components of golf clubs. I could see them doing that for sure. Um, it you know so much of the that that uh, age is about sharing, and you know it, it's you know there it's it's kind of common to be able to share ideas and share designs and all that kind of stuff and. I'm not positive that there's ever going to be a value in, in purchasing those, um, but you never know. I mean, this guy used a putter way uglier than that back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, the putter that won the 1986 Masters. It's yeah. called the Response ZT from McGregor. McGregor Golf, which is no longer in business, really. But Do uh, you still use that putter? I don't use it currently, but I still have it. In what happened to one of those putters, Billy? Oh, well... Yeah, that was, uh, there was a time in my uh, golfing career where I had a little anger issue, and uh, I missed a, another putt. It was on the 15th hole, so I'd missed probably 15 putts in a row that should have gone in. So, um, also, with my lack of skill with hand-eye coordination, I would often throw a ball up in the air and, and try to take a swing at it with my putter. Um, Attempting and to hit the ball and out never, of play. And never hit the ball. I mean, never hit the ball. And I missed another putt on the 15th hole when Kenny and I were playing with a couple of other guys. I think his brother was there as well. I actually not only made contact with the golf ball, but uh, and the ball sailed, I don't know, 100 yards probably? It probably hasn't landed yet. And the head of my putter went with the golf ball and over the fence into the freeway. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. And so, and that was uh, the astonished look on my face is probably, mm. well, it's ingrained in his memory forever. <laughs> I was so sad for the longest time that I actually. Um, if you know Bill, that putter was his It meant baby. everything to me. It yes. meant everything to me. And How, it, it was as if someone had just kicked his dog OB. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, okay, or worse. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say kicked me somewhere else. Okay. However... The story ends well because my good pal here uh, replaced that putter um, just a few short months later, and that putter I still have to this day. It's uh, 30. I have had it for over 30 years. Yeah, well, it, if we take a look at your toys that you brought in, I, I think I you do. keep everything. It's in super mint condition, but I used it for a lot of years to make a lot of putts, uh, the one that he replaced it with, uh, back when I actually could play this game pretty decently. Uh, that, that's still one of my most prized uh, gifts and possessions. But, yeah, uh, talk about a crazy-looking putter. We'll maybe have to bring that in a, uh, one of our uh, next yeah. podcasts and show that what that looked like. During that round of golf, but, we yeah. did what any really good friends would do and had no sympathy for him whatsoever as he sat deducted on the, the green. We we actually both fell out of the cart laughing at him. So, yeah, they yeah. did laugh. However, uh, I think it was Tom and our other friend Jake that they ran and got the head of the putter. Oh, climbed I, the fence. They climbed the fence, went out in the freeway, <laughs> and got the head of my putter. And I would still not have, recommend that, people. I still have that as well. Yeah. So just just the broken head. So that's right off at the hosel. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. So. Give me your guys' take. Uh, 3D printed clubs, wave of the future, or no? I think in the future 
that we're going to see some 3D printed putters available from the manufacturers. Just putters or full full line of equipment? I think at first it's going to be putters. I don't know about other uh, equipment. Um, the drawback to doing it at home is going to be the USGA. There's just way too many variables for them to get approved for to, for play of use and, and using it in a handicap. But I could see as the price comes down uh, from 3D printing and the price continues to escalate. I think the price escalate. is pretty cheap for 3D printers. Yeah. And well, but yeah, so that's the thing. I mean, the, I think the technology is there. But it, it has to perform. Everyone knows if you're a golfer, yeah. you have to have performance. And until someone at home can print out, whether it's a driver or a putter, whatever's going to happen, if it doesn't perform with all the uh, materials and the weighting and everything working, it's, it's which not I gonna, think Which yeah. I think is true. And I think uh, that performance thing is definitely the case. Um, and so I think putters would be probably the at least for a long time, the first and only piece of equipment in your bag that uh, might be an option. Yeah, the USGA sure. is the big wild card though, because you know they have you have to get equipment approved through them to, for use for tournament play, and or to go on the market. Or, right? Yeah, and and printing stuff at home is a huge twist on that. So until they get their arms wrapped around it, it's going to be really yeah, limited. No way to regulate scope. it. Yeah, right? yeah. All right, but, what do you guys think? Right? We want to hear your opinion, too, so let us know. Any any final words? No. Uh, that putter, as ugly as it is, is still prettier than Bill's response, by the way. No. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Shots fired. All right. Um, yeah, go no, ahead. No, 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 that's fine. I, that's okay. I, I, Kenny's making cracks at me. I'll get him back. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Here Maybe he'll have to make a visit out here in one of the next future podcasts. Yes. The putter? Yeah. I'm sure it will. Yeah. It will bring in all of his toys sooner or later. Yeah, yes. definitely. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Hopefully, we'll see you next time on Hazel Rockets. Bye. Bye.